afternoon, good morning everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and a big welcome to our webinar uh, this afternoon, this morning, on communicating food sustainability to consumers. This webinar is part of a collaboration between the WWF, the One Planet Network, which is an initiative of UNEP, and Globescan, a research and advisory consultancy. My name is Abby Curtis O'Reilly, an Associate Director at Globescan, and I have both a passion for and a background in consumer research to inform organisations on the most effective ways to communicate sustainability to the end consumer and ultimately to inspire behaviour change. <clears throat> so for our session today, we will start with a quick introduction. My colleague Nils um, at UNEP will take you through some of the background to the project. We will then be playing a recorded presentation of some of the findings from the recent white paper that WWF have put together on how to communicate food sustainability to consumers. Um, our colleague from WWF Australia, Joshua Bishop, a conservation economist, um, has put together this uh, white paper and he has also recorded the presentation for us today. Unfortunately, he can't be with us live due to the time zone, uh, but we will be playing his presentation and that should take us to around the half an hour mark. After that, we will then start our panel discussion and we are really lucky today to be joined by five different panellists from a very diverse range of organisations and locations as well. So I'll introduce everyone properly before the discussion starts, but briefly, we are joined by Anna Arnberg at Oatley, Ahmad Muazam from Ivoco, Vincent Colomb from the French Environmental Agency, Faros Kaur from Woolworths, South Africa, Marissa Makari from El Poder del Consumador, the Mexican consumer organisation. So really diverse, um, different time zones, different countries, and different perspectives represented today on our panel as well, both from the private and public sectors. If we have time today, we will also look at some questions. So please do uh, submit your questions and your comments in the chat function. And we'll be very happy to answer those if we have time at the end. If we don't have time today, because we do have a lot to fit in, then we will try to follow up by email. So please do let us know if you have any comments um, or questions for our panelists or for any of the project team today. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague Nils at UNEP, who will run us through some of the project background. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Abby, and also welcome from me to everyone on the webinar today. Thank you for joining. Um, just as an introduction to the topic and uh, also the background of the project, uh, we know that consumer behavior around the world is changing right now as a result of the pandemic, political crisis, and also environmental concerns. And with this behavior in flux, uh, it's important for us uh, to understand what are the main drivers that shape behavior and how we can help inform and guide this uh, consumer choice towards more sustainability. At the UN Environment Pro Program, we consider more sustainable consumption production patterns as uh, central to tackle the three planetary crises of climate change, nature loss and pollution. And in 2012, the One Planet Network was formed as a multi-stakeholder platform for the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 12. And uh, in this network, we have the consumer information program that I also coordinate. Um, and uh, this, pro this program uh, serves as a global platform to support the provision of quality information on goods and services and uh, also it tries to identify and implement effective strategies to encourage sustainable consumption. Um, and there we buy, we also engage actors across the food value chain, but also from other sectors, of course, um, particularly on the retail side and food companies uh, on the topic of sustainability information. So that within this framework of the program, we decided to develop this project together with the WWF and Globescan to deepen our understanding how the provision of sustainability information can influence consumers' food choices. Um, we, WWF has been actively working on in integrating behavioral science in its conservation and sustainability projects and in 2020 uh, also launched a behavioral science publication titled The Safe Nature Police Framework and Report that sought to provide an easily adaptable start to applying behavior change interventions. Um, WWF also has deep knowledge of behavior, the evolution, insights of voluntary sustainability standards and eco-labeling initiatives. Uh, and with Globescan we have a partner that is a Global Insights and Advisory Consultancy uh, equipped with the expertise in the area of sustainability communications and certifications, uh, consumer behavior and global trends and, and knowledge of the food and beverage sector in particular. So uh, together we, uh, Globescan in particular also supported us in the development of uh, business and label case studies and uh, in total we have uh, different outputs developed through this collaboration including the white paper that will be presented today that investigates the drivers of consumer choice, uh, sources of consumer information, the differentiation in response between consumer segments, 
on the gaps between observed behaviors and stated preference from consumers when it comes to food sustainability. Um, yeah, we will share all these uh, resources also afterwards, but uh, without giving too much away now, I'm uh, now going to pass the screen over to Joshua Bishop, the conservation economist at WWF Australia. He was the lead author of the report and uh, he will present a summary of the report now and the key findings. This is actually a recording that we made from the webinar yesterday because he's based in Australia. It's a little bit too late for him now to be live here, but uh, we, we still look forward to the presentation to share with you. And then after that, we will go into the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so, so my presentation, presentation today is quite, quite brief, brief uh, but it's, it's going to try to cover uh, the, the report uh, from, from top to bottom, bottom. Um, and the presentation follows the outline of the report with a brief introduction, uh, a uh, excursion into what we know about the drivers of consumer food choices generally, uh, then focus on the role of information and sustainability information in particular, Consumer food choice. Uh, Kate, wrap up with some. If you can hear me, there's a bit of an echo. <laughs> Maybe try yeah. that one. I don't know why there's a echo earlier. It worked fine, right? But um, is everyone on mute? Uh, so, so my presentation, presentation today is quite brief, brief uh, but it's, it's going, going to try, try to cover uh, the, the report uh, from, from top, top to bottom, bottom. Uh, and, and the presentation follows the outline, outline of the report. Of the report. There. Uh, Let me try something else. Sorry, one second. Bear with us, everyone, and apologies for this. We did test tech, but of course, it's chosen now to not play ball. Uh, so, so my, my presentation, presentation today is quite brief, uh, but it's, it's going, going to try to cover uh, the, the report uh, from top, top to bottom, bottom. Um, and the presentation follows the outline of the report with a brief... Bill and Echo, Kate. Do you have a headset on? Yeah. Uh, Uh, then focus on the role of better, better. sustainability information in particular in consumer food choice and wrap up with some general conclusions and recommendations. Next slide. So as I said, uh, first we're going to do a little bit of introduction. Next slide. Um, you've already heard the uh, objectives of the project as a whole. Um, the objectives of the, the literature review or the white paper as we uh, call it, or a little bit more uh, focused. As I said, we want to look at the drivers of food choice, what sources of information consumers rely on when they choose food, how they respond to sustainability information, and particularly to uh, food labels. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities of food labeling and food sustainability information campaigns? How can we strengthen consumers' response to that information? Um, I should point out that uh, this presentation and the report that it's based on focuses on the effectiveness of food sustainability information for influencing consumer choices. Um, we do not attempt to assess the truthfulness of food sustainability claims, which would require uh, analysis of actual production practices, uh, food processing and distribution. Um, that's beyond the scope of this report, which, as I said, focuses on the the consumer or demand side of the, the food uh, food systems. Um, I should note, however, that there is quite a lot of guidance on how to assess the credibility of food uh, sustainability information and claims, and we provide uh, quite a number of uh, relevant resources throughout the report. Next slide. So 
So I think to begin with, it's, it's worth acknowledging something about the food systems that we have in the world today. And um, I've, I've used the word extraordinary. Uh, it, and I, I use that um, without qualification. I think the fact that uh, food systems globally deliver reliable access to diverse foods for billions of people at relatively modest cost um, is a testament to the, um, the, the power of um, our uh, modern world, as well as to traditional food ways in keeping us uh, fed and uh, with, with nutritious uh, foods from all around the world. At the same time, we know that there are uh, some problems in the, the world food systems, um, in ter including many of the issues, environmental impacts listed here, greenhouse gas emissions, forest and biodiversity loss, use of fresh water, um, impacts not just on land, but also in the marine environment, due, largely due to fishing and aquaculture. Um, we know that food waste uh, is uh, rampant all around the world, although concentrated especially in high-income households, and that food waste essentially exacerbates the environmental impact of food because it means we're producing far more food than, than we actually need. Uh, we also know that most food waste ends up in landfill um, where it rots um, and we have yet another contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and climate change. Uh, in short, I think it's fair to say that the, the full costs and benefits of food systems when you take a, a comprehensive look are not shared equitably. Um, between present and future generations. Um, uh, looking specifically at the, uh, the immediate needs, we know that mal malnutrition persists. One in nine people go hungry every day. One in three people are overweight or obese um, uh, due to uh, food consumption. And we also are increasingly seeing evidence that without dietary change, it may be impossible to feed everyone and still stay within uh, what are known as planetary boundaries. Uh, in short, um, sustainable food consumption is a key part of delivering the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot meet those goals without changes in food consumption. Next slide. We need to clarify or, or, or get uh, agreement on what uh, what are definitions, what do we mean by sustainable food, what do we mean by uh, drivers and, and other things. Um, for this report, we, we define sustainable consumption based on what we have uh, read in the literature, and we sum that up by saying that on average, people choose or they are offered food products that use fewer natural resources and have less adverse impact, or even ideally have a net positive impact on the environment. But there's also a social dimension. So food products need to be produced, processed, and distributed in ways that meet or exceed global minimum social standards. And it's important that we include both the social and the environmental dimension in any discussion of food sustainability. In the report, we also look at a number of other key terms, consumers, communication, information, animal sourced foods, eco labels. Um, I, I won't uh, take the time now to go through all of those definitions, but uh, you can read the report for more detail. Next slide. So one of the things that we know when we start looking at drivers of uh, sustainable food is that uh, food systems are incredibly complex. There are many different components to them. You can see across the top some of the, the main drivers. This report and uh, this presentation focuses on that box in the middle with the red circle around it, the consumer behaviors. Um, and we're interested in understanding how to influence those consumer behaviors um, so that we can shift uh, consumers towards more sustainable foods. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, we begin by looking at what are the major drivers of consumer food choices, because that's the context within which sustainability information 
um, has to, to get traction. Next slide, please. Um, and the literature makes it quite clear that there are uh, a huge number of different uh, drivers of uh, consumer food choice, ranging from external, contextual, uh, structural, or supply, supply side factors through to uh, intrinsic or inherent features of food itself and biological um, features of, uh, of human beings, right? The, our, our, our appetites, our tastes, our preferences. Um, there are also social factors, and uh, including culture and tradition and habit and fashion and, of course, prices and many other factors as well. And any attempt to influence food sustainability choices or food choices generally um, needs to take account of all of these different uh, drivers of, uh, of food consumption. Next slide. One of the things that we observe in the literature is that uh, some of these broader drivers, some of these structural or, or contextual drivers are um, are helping. They're, they're pushing consumers towards more sustainable food choices, whereas other drivers are pushing in the wrong direction, away from sustainability. Um, this is um, one of the more comprehensive studies that I've come across um, by Bene et al. Um, and they looked at uh, statistical correlations between different drivers of food systems change and different indicators of sustainability across almost 100 countries. And they found that, uh, unfortunately, most of the drivers they looked at um, that uh, had uh, statistically significant correlations with food system sustainability were uh, pushing in the wrong direction. Some positive correlations, goods and services trade, foreign direct investment, uh, and cereal yield. So that might be surprising to some of you that globalization, certain aspects of globalization are pushing uh, towards more sustainable food systems. But uh, on the other hand, there are a number of negative correlations, growth in per capita GDP, agricultural expansion for obvious reasons, um, uses more land and water, increased fertilizer use, uh, and, and even more so urbanization, population growth, and what the uh, authors call lifestyle change, which they measure as a change in female employment and services, which uh, is interesting, and we could dive deeper into that particular indicator, but I think we'll, we'll move on. You can read about it in the report. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we also observe in the literature is that food sustainability is, uh, is a factor in consumers' food choices, but uh, usually not their top priority when choosing food products. So this data here is from the United States. Um, but I don't think it's atypical of, of other regions. And it shows that uh, over time, uh, taste is identified routinely as, uh, by most consumers as the most important factor, followed by price, healthfulness, convenience. Um, and sustainability is there. It's significant, but it comes much lower. Uh, the dotted line between 2018 and 2019 represents a change in the, uh, the way the question was posed. Um, but essentially, it's the, the, the same trend that we observe. Next slide. We also see that um, consumer food preferences are, are not static, uh, notwithstanding the, the evidence of the previous slide. There are um, discernible uh, trends in, in consumer food preferences. Um, we see the rise of organic foods over the past century, roughly. Um, we see a more recently growing interest in plant-rich diets. Uh, we also see the rise of online food shopping and food delivery services. Um, and we know that these preferences, while they are uh, evolving, they're also subject to disruption. So recently, we've all lived through the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and indeed, we are arguably still living through it. Um, and we've seen uh, how that has affected, for example, the, the preference for online food shopping and food delivery. Um, and most recently, sadly, we've seen the impacts of the war in Ukraine on uh, the supply of fertilizer and wheat and uh, vegetable oil and, and many other commodities um, uh, and the 
dramatic impact that that's having on food prices. Next slide. So the, the bulk of this uh, report uh, focuses on sustainability information and consumer food choices. Next slide. And I, I think uh, the starting point here is to acknowledge that people rely on many different sources of information about food in making their choices. Uh, consumers can find it difficult to assess certain food attributes, uh, in particular claims they can't verify directly. Um, they may perceive seller's claims as a kind of evidence, but not always reliable. Um, they do value information about uh, product attributes, but at the same time, consumers are often unwilling to invest very much time or effort to uh, process that information. And labels are therefore one of the, uh, the sort of shorthand or quick ways that uh, consumers can get information to guide their food choices. Next slide conscious that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move along at a slightly faster clip. Um, we know that uh, trust is a, a key factor in whether consumers um, act on uh, sustainability information, whether from labels or other sources. And most of the evidence here comes from Europe and, and North America. Um, there is a, a real gap in data from the Global South. But we see that uh, European consumers, for example, express most trust in uh, ex independent experts, consumer organizations, and they have less trust in politicians, uh, industry, and uh, retailers. Um, consumers are receptive to small-scale producer voices, but they don't hear much from those producers. Um, and uh, we also learn that if you combine information from multiple sources, that can help build trust. Um, and that ultimately the effectiveness of uh, food labels depends on whether consumers are uh, uh, familiar with the label, whether they understand what it means, um, as well as their trust in its credibility. And those, those factors are interrelated. Uh, plus, there's a, a few um, statistics on the right-hand side from a study in the U.S. on uh, who do people trust, who do consumers trust. Least trusted sources, interestingly, were friends and family, media, and food companies. Food for thought, pun intended. Next slide. Getting to the, um, the nub of uh, this research, do food labels work? Are they effective? And I think the, the answer from the literature is yes. They have a measurable uh, and statistically positive influence on consumer choice of sustainable foods. Uh, labels and other kinds of sustainability guidelines do increase consumers' accuracy in selecting uh, environmentally friendly foods. Um, successful labeling is correlated with knowledge and awareness of a label and its visibility um, and its design. So well-designed labels are meaningful to consumers and are quick and easy to understand. Um, and interestingly, consumers pretty consistently say that they're willing to pay more for uh, labeled products than for conventional foods. It's not a huge margin. Um, but uh, it can make a difference in a, a highly competitive retail market. Next slide. There are a number of challenges with uh, eco-labeling. Uh, in the first place, what consumers say uh, or tell you in a survey doesn't always align with their actual behavior. Um, so there's what we call an intention action gap. Um, we know that labels are more effective with some consumer segments than with others. Female and younger shoppers in particular seem to be more receptive. Likewise, those uh, with higher incomes or more education. And especially consumers with what are called uh, aligned values and beliefs, who are they're already receptive to, to sustainability messages. They are, are more likely to uh, rely on labels to make choices. At the same time, labels can be ignored or misinterpreted. Uh, people may perceive products as better on many more criteria than the label actually uh, conveys. Uh, people may make assumptions about the ingredients of, of packaged food just based on the, um, the, the materials that the, the product comes in. Um, and consumers may attribute health benefits to food products uh, that are labeled even when the label itself uh, says nothing about health impact. So similar uh, lessons from experience with health and nutritional labels 
um, which you can read about in the report. Next slide. Um, one of the other things that we learned from the literature is that sustainability information is more influential when it comes as part of an integrated consumer communication campaign. This is an example from uh, Nor Meal Kits. It's a, a brand uh, owned by Unilever. We have a case study on Unilever if you're interested. Um, and it combined uh, not just the information about sustainability, but uh, nudges and other uh, and, uh, and, uh, training and support and, and uh, promotions, a range of different techniques to uh, encourage consumers to make use of these products, but also to use them with plants rather than meat. So the focus of, of this particular campaign was on encouraging uh, plant-rich diets. Next slide. I think we can summarize some of the, the lessons from um, the, the recent research is that we need to take account of consumer psychology. It's not just, it's not enough to just convey the information. Um, that information is more influential when combined with motivational goals when it, or when it emphasizes social norms. Um, some of the, the empirical research shows that by building community, um, enlisting advice from experts, uh, providing free product samples, um, you can make a, a more uh, significant and sustained difference in uh, consumer behavior. Um, and in particular, that nudges or what we call um, interventions, interventions that uh, influence the, the choice architecture, the way food is presented, um, the, the, the first opportunity, uh, uh, product that is presented to you, for example, uh, can be some of the most influential ways to, to influence food choice. So it's not just about the information, it's about the context within which food is presented to the consumer, um, whether it comes at the top of the menu or further down uh, in, in bold font or normal font. Think subtle differences in, in presentation can make a huge difference. Next slide. I'm going to wrap up now. I've gone uh, over time, I realize. So conclusions and recommendations. Uh, just to recap some of the major conclusions. Next slide. So we know that consumer information is necessary, but insufficient to achieve uh, sustainable food systems. Uh, sustainability is just one of many drivers of uh, consumer food choices. Uh, consumer preferences are evolving um, and often correlated. In general, it's easier to work with the grain of choice drivers rather than against them. So, for example, we can use digital technology, a, re a relatively recent innovation, to verify claims and to confirm food provenance, which makes it easier for consumers to choose sustainable products. Or thinking about globalization of food supply chains, on the one hand, they can reduce consumers' influence on, direct influence on producers, but at the same time, that can, uh, globalization can help spread sustainability messages and methods. We know that consumers respond uh, positively to eco-labels and sustainability information. Um, we also know that, uh, and have learned that how we communicate and to whom is just as important as what we say, and that using behavioral methods and incentives can increase uptake. Last slide. And thank you for your patience. Next slide, please. So some key recommendations. Um, first of all, uh, I think you probably got the message. Um, it's uh, information is part of a broader uh, context. So sustainability communications must be informed by food choice drivers. Uh, consumer education must be based on sound science. There's a lot of myths out there uh, around labels. Um, messages and interventions are need to be adapted to the, the target audience. We need uh, much more research and innovation on the use of incentives, uh, behavioral nudges, and other non-coercive measures to encourage plant-rich and whole food choices. Labels uh, need to be part of an integrated package of communication methods. Uh, any consumer information has to be visible and accessible, easy to understand, reliable, credible, uh, holistic, and comparable. Um, and I think uh, this next point, people who already use sustainability information. So those consumers
consumers who are responsive to food labels and other information about sustainability, we can learn from them. What is it that uh, they know or they feel or they believe that we can use to reach out to groups um, and who are not currently influenced? How do we strengthen and, and widen the social norms around food sustainability? Food businesses can and should collaborate uh, more to identify effective messages and media for encouraging sustainable food choices. At the moment, it's it's commercially in confidence. Um, there's an opportunity maybe to collaborate more to do this uh, in a pre-competitive way. Governments obviously have an important role in uh, encouraging and, and uh, regulating food certifications and rating schemes, but they can also encourage businesses to use some of these more innovative behavioral techniques to communicate sustainability and to make sustainable food choices the, the default option. Um, lastly, sustainability criteria need to be integrated more consistently in national dietary guidelines. Some countries have started down that road. Brazil and Canada come to mind, but we could do much more uh, in that vein. Um, and uh, perhaps most importantly, we need to ensure that sustainable foods are not just a niche product that is accessible only to those who are willing and able to pay uh, the uh, additional cost, but uh, we need government support to ensure wide access to sustainable foods uh, in uh, both the global north and the global south. Great, and a big virtual thank you to Josh there for that presentation. I see lots of questions coming in through both the chat and the Q&A function. Thank you for those. All the questions related to the report, we will direct those directly to Josh um, after the session and um, ask him to come back to you via email. Please do keep typing in questions and, and comments into the chat and we can post them to our panellists at the end of this session if we have time. Uh, so we're lucky to be joined by five panellists today for our panel discussion and I'll briefly introduce them before moving on to our um, big questions for discussion this afternoon. So firstly, we have Anna Arnberg. She's the Sustainability Engagement Manager at Oatly. Oatly, of course, well known for its uh, fearless approach to communication about some of these different challenges facing the food industry and, and how to tackle them. We have Vincent Colom, who is an environmental expert in charge of LCAs and eco-labeling of food products at the French Environmental Agency. And obviously some interesting work going on um, in France in this space at the moment. We have Faros Kaur, who is Group Head of Sustainability for Woolworths Holdings Limited, which runs retail businesses across both Africa and Australasia. And Woolworths' vision is to become one of the most responsible retailers in the world. So, of course, communicating to the consumer is an important part of that. We have Marissa Makari, who works at the um, El Poder del Consumidor, the Mexican consumer organization, and she's a coordinator of nutritional health research. So Marissa will be talking um, about some of her learnings from the health side of things today and how those relate to sustainability. And then finally, we have Ahmad Muazam, the CEO and co-founder of Evoco. And Evoco is a mobile app that enables consumers to make more sustainable food choices by measuring the impact of their food purchases, in particular, the climate footprint. So it's a very um, innovative and interesting work that um, Ahmad is going to share with us today. So these are our panelists for the next 30 minutes or so. And I'm going to start by looking at trends. So I'd like to hear from the panelists about your perspective on some of the big trends. So of course, we heard from Josh about some of the different drivers, factors affecting food purchase. What big trends do you see in terms of food consumption? And, and what do you think the implications are in terms of how we communicate food sustainability? Um, I'd like to start perhaps with our panelists from the business side of things. So for us, would you like to kick us off with your perspectives and then we can move to um, Anna at Oatly after that. Happy to take the Sure, thank you very much for the, for the question. I think um, some of the trends have been touched on already, but <clears throat> excuse me, firstly, in the, in the manner in which we're seeing people shop, there's certainly a move to, to more online um, shopping um, spurred on by the, the global lockdowns, um, particularly in South Africa. I think we saw a significant acceleration across the board in all types of uh, product uh, ranges, whether it's um, we'll, we'll, we'll in, in, in a few months. 
this is um, so you can move to online. I think there's also so uh, whether spurred on by the by the pandemic or not, but clearly a move to more awareness of the type of products people are consuming. Um, you know, multi. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, that are consumed, so people want to know what they're eating, or what they buy, um, uh, how is it produced. So provenance becomes becomes a question as well. Um, uh, what is that, the nature of the product? How is it sourced? Uh, I'm lost for us. So another technical issue with this happening. Pardon me. Can can you hear me now? Yes, you're back. So so so. There's also, uh, despite the move to 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 awareness of 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 what they're eating and how healthy the product is, uh, uh, um, the influence of price is always there. I think uh, affordability uh, and and uh, uh, value for money are are key drivers, and then. The other point I would say is we see an increasing move to to questioning the you know the type of protein that is consumed and, and particularly to uh, increase in unfortunately seem to have lost for us again, but it does bridge quite nicely. Some of the key to the Great, thank you, Fraz. And that bridge is very nicely over to Anna um, to talk about some of the trends you've seen from your perspective at Oatly, obviously very um, involved in the plant-based space. Yes, hi, thank you for having me. And um, I um, hope that my sound will be better. I heard some bits of Feroz and I and I agree with a lot of them. I was um, thinking more of a trend that we see as a company and um, looking a lot at, and that is a trend in marketing regulations and green claims and how that will be um, regulated more, which um, I think is very, very positive because it is really hard as a consumer today to understand the different messages and green claims and net zero and and understand what they actually mean. And um, I think it can only be good with more regulations. And I mean, we ourselves have gotten input as well on how we can clarify our messages and make sure that they are accurate and understandable. And I think that's really good input for companies and um, I think as a consumer today this really hard to understand the choices you the impact of your choices but also to understand that we do have challenges in the food system I mean sometimes I can feel like everything is fine because I see all these positive messages when I buy food and I think we also have more I don't know if that is a trend but more awareness around climate change and the IPCC report last year on you know, we will reach or cross one and a half degrees warming, probably around the early 2030s and food systems being about up to a quarter or a third of those emissions. And I think it's very hard for consumers to understand the different messages of that and also being in the grocery store online or in real life and understanding that there's a connection. So that's a big trend that I'm very positive about it. And I really hope that we can clarified for consumers also so as um, Joshua said like we have to work with food to reach the uh, sustainability development goals and uh, I hope that the regulations will not only be around positive things that companies can say but also what we need to declare around the impact that we have and hopefully it will be easier for consumers to make the connection around what they eat and climate and, and other environmental impacts. Yeah, great. And I say balancing that transparency that we need, but also the positive engagement um, to, to help enable and encourage consumers. So I'm going to hand to Vincent now. Obviously, Anna mentioned the importance of regulations, which is the space you are, of course, um, involved in. Any perspectives, Vincent, on the trends? Thank you, Abby, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I agree with, with what has been said. For me, the big trends, maybe, are also uh, what the huge trend is really the lack of confidence from the messages from the company now. The consumer, even if a company is doing really uh, important progress, the consumer has very little trust, at least in France, regarding all those messages. 
And uh, I think there's also interest to go beyond the, the premium, the, the levels of high quality, but it's also, there's also an interest to distinguish between a very poor product regarding environmental aspects and a medium one. And so we need to have some schemes that can cover all the range of products and not the 10% best products, which is a bit the current trend with the usual le levels. And that's uh, a bit what we're working on also in, in France currently and how to, to recover the full range of, of products. Great, thanks, Vincent. And Marissa, I'm going to come over to you now. That is there any learnings from your work in the health sector? How have you tried to overcome some of these challenges? Yeah, well, just echoing a bit what Anna was speaking about, in Mexico, we have a front of pack nutrition label. And as part of that regulation, the claims on nutrition were also regulated and health claims and marketing on the product package, for example, the use of characters attractive to children were also regulated. And the idea of that was it's such a crowded space, the product, the product, um, the product package. So for the label to really have maximum impact, you need to make sure that the consumer is not sort of conflicted or confused by the other elements of the package. So I think that's you know a trend, this type of more comprehensive regulation in the health space. And we can learn from that for food sustainability uh, regulations and labels. And then I also wanted to mention quickly ultra processed foods, the increase in consumption around the world and most recent of those types of products. The health, um, understanding the health impacts of that is very clear and in the public and the conscious. Um, but there's also, you know, impacts in terms of biodiversity loss, use of single use packaging. And so for the consumer talking about these issues of health and sustainability, not in silos, but really communicating them, not on the label, but communicating them more generally in campaigns, talk about small practices that have both impacts on improving sustainability and health of, uh, yeah, diets. I think, you know, kind of merging those ideas could be useful for the consumer. Yeah, I totally agree with that. A lot of global science research shows that health, obviously being such a primary driver, can really help when trying to explain sustainability if we can make credible connection between the two, which isn't always the case. Um, but increasingly, I think it is. Um, Ahmed, I'm going to come to you. You've obviously got um, quite a new innovative tool when it comes to communicating to um, consumers on sustainability. How, how are you guys kind of riding and dealing with some of these trends? Yes, I suppose um, when it comes similar to what everyone's been saying, when it comes to the consumer side, we're seeing a lot more demand for that kind of transparency, trying to understand the provenance, and um, and also just the way that people are consuming. I suppose um, a lot of it has been moved towards uh, a lot of people trying to eat a bit more plant based, and we're seeing that happen on kind of like you know people do like say meat free Mondays, that kind of thing, and um, all those kind of uh, positive changes. And I think one lasting effect that we've kind of noticed over the last maybe year is uh, that kind of stage that we thought was maybe an early indication of the pandemic, but kind of has stayed on, are more people actually doing uh, multiple shops in a week rather than, say, your traditional big shop and, a, and one or two top-ups, but people kind of still having that, going to their local shop and buying uh, multiple times in the week. And for, um, I suppose, an app like ours, that's... Um, um, it gives us more chances to try and influence their purchasing behavior because we have more of those uh, touch points with them, so um, which is really interesting. And I think what that normally tra uh, transpires to as well is that a lot of times they're supporting more local shops when they're kind of shopping more often than it isn't those big trips to the supermarket. But I think still think it spills. Um, um, I think the understanding of that um, sustainability piece and like the education around that is still lower. Um, then we would think it would be at this point that although there's a huge, a lot more awareness in it, um, it's still a lot lower. But to maybe go on a positive angle of that is that um, from the way that people have been consuming, from our conversations with retailers, we're seeing a lot more kind of impetus on their side as well to get involved in it. And um, a lot of the conversation has been more around um, how they can get it out in front and try and start tackling those scope three emissions. So for us, a couple of years ago, when we started, there wasn't a lot of that conversation. Retailers didn't really want to know on that side of things. But um, in, say, the last, say, two years, that even if it's not publicly kind of, um, and said, a lot of them would be doing those, um, I suppose, analysis of their scope three emissions and having internal strategies of 
how they're going to try and kind of tackle that and sell more, um, I suppose, lower impact and plant-based products as well. Great, that's inspiring to hear that you've seen a, t a change in terms of um, interest from retailers just in the last two years. That's great. Um, so I'll stay with you, Ahmed, for our next question, which is any successful examples or tips in terms of how to influence consumer choices towards more sustainable food choices? So obviously, Josh had lots of um, theory and examples in his um, paper that he shared with us, but any real life examples, either from your work or from what you've seen um, other organisations doing? Yeah. I suppose one of the biggest changes we've done in the last year was bringing in, um, I suppose, a tangible target for consumers to aim for when it came to, and this is just speaking of people who use our app. So um, I suppose we borrowed uh, the whole concept around the pantry boundaries framework and brought that into our own app and gave people kind of a target to aim for when it came to carbon footprint uh, from their groceries. So similar to when you're using, say, um, you know, apps like my fitness pal or diet apps, you might have like a calorie target, but we gave them people a CO2 target, which made it more tangible for people. So like uh, what that looked like is in Ireland for us was 65 kilograms of CO2 from their food purchases uh, per month. And we um, based that off kind of a 1.5 degrees uh, lifestyle um, for the consumer. And what we saw from that was just the increase in retention um, for us was like tripled over a couple of weeks just from users actually having something uh, tangible to try and aim for. And I suppose other kind of tips that we gave people by so the target kind of gave that, I suppose, carrot for people to kind of aim for, but then to actually try and reduce their impact, I suppose, is just giving them small steps that they can try and uh, follow. So like some of our tips would be around kind of um, portion control um, is a massive one, particularly when you're eating higher um, impact products, such as like, say, you know, beef and meat and uh, uh, animal-based products, that um, a lot of times you can get the same utility out of the food by even just, say, halving the meat portion in that food or having, say, thinking of it as, say, less meat meals in a day rather than even going the full day where you're eating just plant-based. And we've seen um, kind of anecdotally from users just, completely being able to kind of reduce their impact um, a lot from those kind of um, actions. Great, thank you. And I'm going to move over to uh, Anna now at Oatly. Obviously, Ahmed um, mentioned having targets there as a really um, useful motivator for consumers. And obviously, that's relevant to Oatly's work on carbon footprinting they've been doing. Would you say the same kinds of things have been useful in terms of engaging consumers? Anna, or do you have any other tips or examples to share? Um, yeah, so we do um, work a lot with that. And um, I would just want to say, like, first off, um, just having uh, having products that enable people to make sustainable choices or even make choices is um, it's a big win for us to even exist as we are a, a dairy company doing things out of oats. That was uh, not something that people were doing back in the day. So we're very like that is a big win for us. But also, um, yeah, on the climate footprint. So that's a more um, serious part of our business. I know, or I don't know, but I, I know that some people think that, you know, Oakley could be quite um, silly and ridiculous. And it's all about, like, we try to focus on making things that it's actually a choice that is tasty, but also trying to be a company that is fun, that makes it easy. So also to the point in, in the white paper of a lot of people don't make their choices uh, based on their values when they're actually making the purchase. So we're trying to um, ap appeal to a lot of groups, not just vegans, but trying to get the bigger masses to just choose our products because they think we're tasty and nice and fun. So that is a big win if we can get many more consumers to do it just for that reason. But I would also be very proud if they would do it for sustainability reasons. And so but I know that all not all consumers is, uh, all consumers are driven by that. But uh, so with the climate footprints, that is a, a more background, perhaps serious side of our company where we take the responsibility of being a food company very serious. So the, we started making uh, the climate footprints for our products back in 2019, and it started originally for internal use to understand our impact and where to reduce and and how to lower our own footprint. And then we just realized that it was also a very usable information for consumers and especially in trying to make that connection between food and climate. So uh, one example from the top of my head connected to that is also I really believe in collaborations. 
And so we collaborated with other brands in Germany a couple of years ago and made uh, a petition to the Bundestag there where you can make a petition and if over 50,000 people sign it, they have to bring the question up in their government. And it was a question on making uh, climate footprints declaration, declarations a law uh, for food companies so that consumers could use that information. So we do work a lot with it. And I think that is a good example of showing that people are interested in it and um, would like some more hands-on information about not only what we would like to say in our own sustainability claims, but also just the real impact. Great, thank you. Um, and for us, your perspectives from South Africa, you're obviously taking quite a different approach um, to Oatly in terms of communications. Anything that's worked particularly well that you would like to share? I think, um, you know, communicating with consumers, we find is uh, a long term kind of thing. You know, you, you need to be repeating messages. You need to be meeting them where they're comfortable being communicated to. So unpackage communication certainly is important. I think it's, you know, a key, a key thing when decisions are being made. But, you know, uh, direct communications to consumers, uh, having them interact with some of your other material and collateral where you tell you'll be able to tell more of the background story of the product so whether it's on your website whether it's direct comes from emailers social media and so on so of various factors but certainly the the package itself um is is the is the thing that when a consumer is shopping particularly when they're in store uh, is the is the thing they'll hold in there and they'll, they'll, they'll make decisions based on what they see around them. And so it needs to be clear, unambiguous, needs to be credible. Um, you need to be able to commit to the to be in front of that uh, trust and um, leave the message that's being communicated. So I think um, particularly when it, it comes to trying to, to land messaging on complex issues around things like sourcing, around I'm, I'm hearing about, for example, carbon labeling. So we want to move to that to that point, but you need to educate consumers around what does carbon labeling mean? What, you know, what's the, what's the value of reporting on the carbon of the product? Um, there's also the, the question of when you, when you, when you communicate on a product, consumers want to make quick decisions when in a quick and simple manner, and there's competing information on, on, on products. There's the branding, there's, uh, health information, there's, there's, um, ingredient information there might be recycling information that you have on packaging and so how do you ensure that whatever you're trying to communicate is clear it's it's the, the message it comes across but it doesn't simplify you know you you want to you want to give a, a strong message but it, you don't want to to simplify or even worse as greenwashing so i think there's a number of um of competing interests that that come into play but i think overall it's about having a a holistic approach to communication and, 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 and trying to get the message across in various touch points. Yeah, thank you for us. Um, you, you mentioned a holistic approach to communication and carbon labelling, so that takes me to Vincent. Any learnings, Vincent, from your work or any examples from the, the French market that you think are useful to share? Um, yeah, maybe uh, just to say that in France, uh, we have a specific context with the climate law that has been calling for a broad scale and compulsory labeling uh, in the coming three to five years. And a food product is one of the first sector to be working on. And uh, so that's a very important dynamic for all the stakeholders. And uh, one of the key topics is uh, how to give the priority between the, as we say, the packaging, the animal product and so on. And for, for this, there is quite a consensus that the life cycle assessment approach is uh, really the core concept and methodology that should be used for environmental assessment and communication. And uh, the discussion afterwards, so uh, we had two years experiments and uh, there were some highlights that I can share very quickly, but one of them was uh, that we have to go towards this uh, multi-criteria. So we, at the same time, encompassing all the farm to fork, but also different aspects as climate, but not only climate, also aspects as such as water, biodiversity that are key to avoid some trade-off. And for that, it's uh, the LCA approach is, is uh, the best one, but even the LCA is not like fully operational on all these topics, especially in biodiversity. And so we need to find some uh, indicators that uh, 
work well on biodiversity and that's uh, something that uh, there's no consensus on for example assessing the impact of one food product on biodiversity and so this is a big challenge for the scientific community but at the same time we know the biodiversity crisis is very high and going fast so there's a bit of an agenda decisions of how we work with incomplete indicators as well as possible so that's uh, the big trend and the um, well, the main outcomes is that we are able to, to develop really like large-scale uh, schemes uh, based on, on LCA with default data. So we built some databases. Uh, we have one that's called Agribali, that is a French uh, national databases on food products, and which is a great support to do this kind of information. And I, I really uh, support other countries to, to develop similar kind of, of work. And then based on this average data, we can build with more specific uh, uh, company specific data to adjust the average data and really provide a reliable science based information for the consumers, enabling also ranking between packaging, type of product, and so on, and encompassing all the, the key topics. So that's maybe, and so we are on the working very actively. There's been some testing already, and we hope that uh, next year we have a fully operational um, methodology and, and we implement it uh, in, in France. Yeah, hugely complex, the work that you're doing, um, Vincent. So definitely with the rest of us are watching the French market, I think, closely. Um, I just want to come to Marissa and give you a chance to um, answer this question. Marissa, you were talking earlier about the um, connections between health and sustainability. Any businesses or organisations you think are communicating that well to the consumer? Um, well, I think it's important to mention as one element or sort of good practices in Mexico and probably in many countries in the global south, a lot of small scale producers and you know, those who are practicing agroecological practices uh, and really in, you know, intending to promote biodiversity cannot afford to enter, you know, certification schemes to have a certain label. So some uh, local, more participatory community schemes have developed, um, you know, those that are based on uh, well, those that include a variety of actors, including experts, sometimes universities are involved, consumers, small scale producers, creating a very transparent uh, criteria by which, for example, certain small scale producers can or cannot enter a market to sell their goods. Um, those are good opportunities. They also provide learning for small scale producers um, that may eventually want to enter a large scale, more mainstream uh, certification program. But I think those kind of small projects and initiatives are important to mention. And in terms of sort of tips or good practices that we've seen in the development of the in the in the health space and the development of the front of pack food nutrition label have been the development of safeguards against conflict of interest, because really to ensure that consumer trust in the label, it's very important um, that they feel the information they're receiving is evidence-based and non-biased and creating sort of uh, rules of the game as to who can participate, who can implement and evaluate the label um, and safeguarding those labels against conflicts, I think is very interesting, uh, very important to consider in the sustainability space. Great, thanks, Marissa. Um, very conscious of time. We've hit the um, hour mark now. We're at the top of the hour. I would just like to ask panelists just to maybe share just a couple of words about, you know, what do you feel most inspired about in terms of this um, area? You know, where are the big opportunities? What's making you feel positive about how we communicate sustainability? We know what the challenges are, but just in a couple of words, I'm going to go alphabetically. Ahmad, to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, I think probably what's the most exciting, um, I think, is the fact that we're doing so much of this communication and what that communication is going to do is highlight all the cracks that we have that's, that's been hidden to the consumer and the general public for the greatest time. So I think it's, although like we are trying to influence a lot of behaviour, I think it's the secondary effect of, um, I suppose, the food companies and producers and people seeing all that, I suppose, their dirty laundry as such uh, being kind of aired out is what's going to drive them to actually make those uh, back end changes that are really needed. So I think, um, yeah, the big change, changes are in the back, and all we can do is highlight them at the moment and then find solutions to help support that transition. Yeah, raising awareness to create that systemic change that we need. Uh, Anna, any final comments? Uh, well, excited to see that more food producers are um, declaring their tri their climate footprints, so consumers actually can compare and, and build an understanding. And uh, as I am in the plant based area, a lot of new brands and products coming up. And you know, if you've been 
a vegetarian or eat uh, plant-based, you would know that back in the day, it wasn't that much to choose from. And now an increase will make it easier and also put some competition on plant-based brands, which is good to become even better in, uh, in the sustainability area. So I'm looking forward to that, to the heat. <laughs> Great, that's refreshing to hear a company that wants more competition. Uh, for us, any final words from your side? I just think it's great that the ecosystem is developing in this and that you know, it is both driven by consumer demand, but also companies becoming more aware that they need to be more transparent. I think it will just allow us to 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 clean up supply chains. And yeah, I agree that the competition is good. Sometimes it's just competition on level of disclosure and you know, companies like to compete with each other. But I think at the end, if it makes the systems better and we get more informed consumers, then that's brilliant. Great, and Marissa? I think a lot of uh, mobilization between consumers and producers, small scale producers, both at the international level and the local level, that helped to sort of reduce that uh, gap between intention and action and inform consumers um, sort of what kinds of practices they can carry out, what kinds of policies can they promote um, to create sort of, or to enable uh, healthy and sustainable diets to be kind of the easy ones. I think that's really important. And also the development of uh, food-based guidelines that kind of guide policies which inform consumers um, the practices that are not only good for their health but also for planetary health. Thank you. Vincent? Mm, I would say um, for my conclusion that I think it's a really interesting moment as we have more and more data that is available that's giving great opportunity for food transparency and the challenge now how we convert all this data in a usable information science base for the consumer to move towards more sustainable food. I think it's a, it's a big challenge for all the food community and great opportunities as well. Yeah. Great, thank you everyone. Really great discussion. And despite the diversity of organizations, I think some commonalities between what some of you were saying. Um, so I'm going to pass to Nils again now at UNEP just to wrap up in terms of where everyone can find some of this information. Uh, before I do that, I know there's lots of questions that have come in and comments on the chat and the Q&A. We really appreciate those. Thank you so much. Um, we will do our best to get back to you um, directly. And apologies that we didn't have time today to cover those. Nils, over to you. Yeah, so I think we are already over time. I just want to say thank you once again, uh, Abby, for the moderation also all our panelists for the great discussion and uh, of course also appreciate uh, George's presentation on the report. I already put the link to the report and the case studies uh, in the chat and we will also share that by email as a follow-up, send the recording and PowerPoint presentation over as well. And then um, yeah, we know there's a lot of challenges uh, still to resolve I think in the food space and in terms of consumer information there's a lot of room for improvement. And we in the program will continue to work on the topic and uh, happy to engage with other stakeholders like uh, presenting today um, in this space. Thank you very much for your participation as well to all attendees and uh, goodbye. Thank you everyone. Bye.